introduction. All right, just a quick refresh. My name is Alyssa Morrow. This is Eric Tu, and we're from the AMP Lab right over on the bay at uh, UC Berkeley. And today we're going to be talking about distributed visualization for genomic analysis. OK, so let's talk a little bit about a background right now. So what do we mean to analyze a genome? What is genomic analysis? And what is our goal in genomic analysis? Well, we can think of genomes as the source code for life. The human genome in particular is 3.2 billion base pairs a program of A, T, Gs, and Cs. And these are split across 46 files, or chromosomes. So we can actually think of these 46 files as 23 files, but each one is duplicated once. So across the human species in particular, genomes are 99.9% .9 similar. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to take all of these similarities and kind of squash them together and find an average genome. And this is what's referred to as the reference genome. So if we're 99.9% .9 similar, what about that other 0.1% difference? Is it important? Well, it actually is extremely important. As this 0.1% variance gives rise to a very diverse set of traits and diseases across a population. So really at the end of our day, at the end of the day, our goal here is to draw conclusions from these, this small amount of variance. So kind of how do we draw conclusions from variance? Well, what we'd like to do is look at a population and say, okay, at a particular point, what's the frequency at which we see this variant? What are the individual genotypes from the individual samples that express this variant? Do we want to look around the region of the variant to see if there's any patterns in the surrounding areas of the individuals who have this variant? So this kind of workflow I've just discussed is a very great case for genomic visualization, as we'd like to explore the variants and the regions around the variants and the individuals that might, con um, might have mutations at that point. OK, so let's take a step back and say, how do we actually get this genomic data in the first place? This might be a review for some of you, but we'll just go through it quickly. So we get our genomic data from what's called a genome sequencer. And we can actually model this problem as a simple sentence. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. So what we do is we take our DNA, or in this example, our sentence, and input it into a genome sequencer. And what we get as output is just a bunch of smaller subsequences of our original input. And we can see they're kind of overlapping in no particular order. So what we're going to have to do next is align these sequences to get some idea of what our genome actually looks like. So if the genome sequencer could take our DNA in, as input and output a perfect string in the correct order, none of this would be a problem and we could just skip these steps. However, because we have these subsequences, we have to align them and have some probability for at every given location, what base do we see? So the accuracy in which we can find a base at a given location is kind of reminiscent of the coverage. So the amount of replication at each sequence we see, that's kind of referred to as coverage. So higher coverage provides higher accuracy. And today, for only about $1,000, we can sequence a 30x coverage copy of your genome. OK, so we have our genomic data. We've aligned our genomic data. What's the next step? The next step is to actually find the variance. So we've taken those subsequences, and we have our resulting alignment that we've aligned to that reference we talked about earlier. So now what we want to do is find where in this sentence do we find any variance. And what we see here from this example is that over on the worst, it looks like we have a variant from an O to a U. And because it happens four times, with very high probability, that is actually a variant. OK, so we have our genomic data. We've processed our genomic data. So at the end of the day, what does this leave us with? Well, back in the early 2000s, we had the Human Genome Project. And this actually left us with only 10 gigabytes of data. This is very easy. Today, this can be very easily fit on a single machine. But if we fast forward to 2014, projects like TCGA are producing three petabytes of raw genomic data. And if we extrapolate out further, these projects are producing more and more raw data. And this is in the amount of samples and in the coverage that are making these, um, making these data sets larger. So if we have all this data, a question we can ask is, how do we actually visualize it? Three petabytes, I don't know about you, but doesn't fit on my individual laptop. 
So th this is a case for distributed visualization. We can do these visualizations in a distributed environment to lower the cost by running on commodity machines while scaling up to these larger data sets. So there are current genome browsers that allow you to visualize genomic data. But the main problem with these genome browsers is that they don't scale. So let's first talk a little bit about what current genome browsers look like, and then we'll talk a little bit about what the ideal browser might look like. So currently today's landscape, in a genome browser, we can view a few chromosome samples at a time. If we're viewing variant data, this can be about 60 gigabytes. Um, so it will easily fit on an individual laptop if you'd like to view a single chromosome. Furthermore, they can explore and zoom out to 0.00125% of the entire genome. What this means is if, if you have a bunch of chromosomes, really all you can view is a very small slice of your data set. And this kind of inhibits our ability to explore around the genome. Lastly, they only provide single node scalability. So if we're trying to view data from the TCGA, we have three petabytes of data, and we can't fit this on a single laptop or a single computer, we run into a problem. So now let's talk about the ideal browser. What does this look like? Well, ideally, we could view, compare, and explore thousands of not only chromosome, but whole genome samples. And for this, if we just take the variant data, not even the raw genomic data, for about two to 3,000 samples, this can be about one to two terabytes of data already. Secondly, we'd like to explore and zoom to whole chromosome resolution. What we'd like to do here is compute uh, summary statistics of larger regions of the genome that give us an idea of what we're looking at if we'd like to explore from a larger resolution. And lastly, we'd like multi-node multi scalability. Like I mentioned earlier, we would like to scale horizontally to larger data sets, but also run on commodity machines to decrease the price. So in light of these shortcomings and the goals that Alyssa just pointed out, uh, we set out to make a genome browser that scales, and this is our work. Um, it's called Mango. So the first thing you need to know about it is it scales. So uh, you can run on a cluster. You can store as much data as you want. If you have a 100 uh, gigabyte uh, data set or if you have, you know, like a data set of a few terabytes, you can store that as well. You can operate on it. Uh, obviously, if you bring data into a distributed environment, you have additional computing power. So we can compute over much larger regions and we can return that uh, information to you much faster. And once we have this additional compute and storage power, a question we need to ask is, well, what can we do with that? Well, uh, we want to make sense of very large regions. So we can use this additional compute power to really look at very large summary statistics, and we provide visualizations to do that. So you, typical interaction with our browsers, you look at uh, regions of a few million bases, and you sort of zoom in and zoom in and zoom in until you really get to the nitty gritty and to what you want to view. And lastly, the thing to know about Mango is we're built on existing analytics tools. So you can easily plug in Mango into uh, many other tools within the Hadoop ecosystem. And uh, we're built off existing open source technologies that have lots of documentation make it very easy to develop for. So you may have heard of other projects within our research group, the Big Data Genomics Research Group at UC Berkeley. And uh, I'll just sort of briefly describe them. Essentially, uh, all our projects are based off core Atom APIs, and Atom is a project that brings in genomic data into the world of big, big, uh, big data systems. So it reads in legacy genomic formats, it, and then you can sort of format them as Apache Parquet, and you can operate on them uh, with Spark. So for right now, all the projects, Atom, Avocado, and Noki, these are all parts of the genomic pipeline analysis. So these are large computational processes. These are very large batch operations. And we want a slightly different goal, but we fit in right alongside that. Uh, Mango is, supports fast multi-sample visualization, where our workload isn't these large batch computational pipelines, but rather very low latency selective queries that we want to display and format for visualization. So how do we do this? I'll briefly describe the architecture. 
Uh, similar to many of the components within our research group, uh, we use a layered approach for modular components. This means that uh, for the data formats, you can use not only legacy genomic form formats, such as BAM, VCF, the stuff a lot of bioinformaticists are familiar with, but you can also read in Apache Parquet, and it works just, just as well. You just point it to the data that you already have staged, and uh, we can use it. In addition, you can also sort of swap out the front end component. While we think we've made lots of great visualizations, and we used D3 to do that, uh, you can sort of swap that out, and then Mango essentially just becomes a data servicing layer where it just returns you the data, you can choose what to do with it. We utilize commonly used big data technologies, so uh, with Spark and Atom, these are all very easy to use. You can tune your jobs, you can see what's going on. Um, you know, for visualizations, we use D3, so it's really easy to make your own custom visualizations. Uh, Mango also runs both locally and distributedly, so there's no need to have tools uh, on your laptop if you just want to look at something with higher latency. Um, you know, you just want to look at a small file, you can do that. It scales elegantly to the amount of storage and compute resources you have, so you don't have to do any parameter tuning. Just boot it up, and it should work. Of course, when you're doing low latency queries, Spark wasn't initially built for this, so we provide a lot of optimizations within the Mango architecture to have these optimized low latency selective queries, and I'll briefly go over them. So the goal with all these optimizations is to achieve interactive latencies on top of a Spark and Atom, which is a batch-oriented platform. And interactive latencies we describe to be around 500 milliseconds, so you can sort of have uh, you know, interactive um, interactions uh, with, with your browser. And we provide three different types of optimizations. The first is persistent store. So when you want to read in data sets, you want to read them into Spark, you pull them off persistent store first. So how do we reduce this initial overhead cost? Uh, once we read it into memory, how do we organize it in memory so we can have efficient access and compute on it? And thirdly, what is the type of computation that we perform on it, and how do we uh, make that efficient and meaningful for visualization? So for persistent store to limit the initial overhead cost, uh, we have essentially a two-pronged approach. Uh, the first is selective access, so instead of just loading all your entire data set into memory and operating on it in Spark, we only want to access selective subchunks of that data. For Parquet and for Atom files, we can use a pred a predicate pushdown and projections to only fetch in the fields of data that we want and the data that spe specifies a given predicate, which is usually a range in the genome. And for legacy genomic formats, we don't really have the luxury of having predicate pushdown, but there are genomic indexes that we can use. And in addition, because what we make is an application, uh, a lot of times when users are sort of browsing around, there will be periods of idleness. And during these periods, we can uh, sort of materialize regions of the genome so that when they actually view them, uh, they're already there in memory, ready to return. And right now, we optimize for a panning interaction, so it loads in the data from the left and the right. For memory optimizations, we also use a two-pronged approach. The first is something we call lazy materialization, and the rationale behind this is that uh, because we're only viewing small chunks of the data, not the entire genome, it doesn't make sense to uh, exhaust all uh, cluster resources. So we have this working set of data uh, based on user queries that we just slowly build up over time with the assumption that users sort of look at regions they previously looked at and won't really jump around. Uh, once we actually store all the data, we, we store it in a structure called an interval RDD. So an RDD uh, in Spark is basically Spark's default storage abstraction. It's, it's backed by an array, uh, and that makes sense if you're loading in all the data. But for us, uh, we want to optimize for an operation called a two-dimensional range query. So you can think of this as, yeah, I have a given range, let's say 1,000 base pairs on chromosome 20, and I want to fetch all alignment records or all variants within this overlapping range. Um, we can use an interval RDD, which is backed by an interval tree that fetches this very quickly. And within the structure, we also store the data for multiple samples, so it's just right there where you need it. Okay, so the last type of optimization we made is computational optimizations. So once we've loaded all of our data into memory, how do we store it in a way that can provide low latency queries for a visualization setting? So our approach is a data tiling approach. And a lot of visualization tools use this data tiling approach, but previously they're mostly meant for numerical data tiling. So we just had to edit the data tiling approach a little bit to work for sequence data because the main abstraction for genomic data is sequences. So what we have here is an image of a six-layered approach, which is what we use. So at the very bottom layer, um, 
Here we view the actual raw data from the genome sequencer. So you can see down there at layer zero, we can view the actual raw reads of the data. And at every point in the genome, we can view every insertion, deletion, and mismatch at every single read. So on the next layer up, we can't exactly view all of the raw data. It's a little overwhelming, especially for the browser. So what we do is we calculate summary statistics at every given base pair in the genome. So at a given base pair, we can calculate what's the frequency that we see a certain mismatch, what's the frequency that we see a certain insertion or deletion, and that's what we display in layer one. The next four layers take a little bit of a different approach. They use a sliding window approach. So what we do is we just take a sliding window and compute an aggregate and run the sliding window across the genome to compute a bunch of, um, a bunch of aggregates that give you an idea of what mismatches are at a given base pair. Okay, so we've run both local and distributed comparisons. Um, the local comparisons were mostly to um, provide parity against existing browsers. So this graph you see here is uh, the la latency of an existing very, um, a very popular existing state-of-the-art browser, and it's run just on a local machine. The query pattern we use here is very um, indicative of most scientific visualization workloads. So we start from a zoomed out region of the genome and zoom in all the way to about a thousand base pairs and then we zoom left and right around the region of interest. So we can kind of see the spike in the workload um, of the latency and this is basically the first point in which the genome loads data. So we get a little bit of spike of latency and then it goes back to around two seconds. Note that the dashed line at the bottom is the interactive threshold. So this is what we'd like, 500 milliseconds for interactive resp response times. Okay, so here's our overlay with the results for Mango. We have a little bit of a startup overhead once you initially start up Mango and we're working to drive those times down. But we can see a pretty close to, um, close to parity for existing browsers on a single machine. Note we're still far from the 500 uh, millisecond latency, however, um, Mango isn't necessarily just intended for a single, a single node, as we will see in the next slide. Okay, so our next question was, how does Mango actually scale? And this is run on the 1,000 genomes variant data. So this was about 2,500 samples, and these queries are run just on one chromosome of data. Um, just like the local, uh, the local slide, we still have some overhead on the startup, but we can see past eight cores, we start approaching interactive latency. We see that it kind of starts flattening out from 32 to 128 cores. This is kind of due to a bug in Spark that we're looking to uh, fix, but once we fix that, fix that bug, we, um, we think that the scalability will um, scale out a lot nicer. So. So we've made a lot of progress, but uh, there's still a ton of work to be done. The first thing we want to do is improve the flexibility of our application. So right now, uh, when servicing data, Mango provides a very simple interface where you basically input a start and end range and it fetches all the records within that range. But we understand that a lot of genome browsers provide essentially their own query interface where you can issue uh, pseudo SQL queries and have uh, much more advanced queries. Um, we can do this by sort of extending the Spark SQL package and uh, doing so will dramatically increase the usefulness of our data servicing layer. We also understand that in scientific and genomic analysis, reproducibility is really important. So uh, the creators of the Spark notebook gave a talk earlier today about uh, you know, integrating Atom and some of the work in our group uh, to the Spark notebook, but if we sort of extend that to Mango and uh, custom genomic visualizations, that'll increase the usefulness of genomic analysis. And finally, uh, one of our optimizations right now, we have a very uh, simple prefetching algorithm that fetch materializes regions to the left and right. Um, but if we model user behavior, we can better uh, issue suggestions for interesting regions within the genome and materialize those to further decrease the latency and achieve interactive times. So Mango's under rapid development. Uh, right now, it's just us two working on it. Uh, but if you want to help out or if you want to uh, check us out, you know, give us feedback, please visit our GitHub, Big Data Genomics slash Mango. And if you want to look at all the other projects developed in our research group, uh, go to bdgenomics.org. So thanks for listening, and now we're open to questions.
was actually... I'll repeat, I'll repeat the question. Oh. Uh, I was looking at your visualization of colors, and I was wondering how many colors were there. On this graph right here? Yes. Or this? yes. There's actually only four. Really? Yeah, uh, A, T, G, and C. Um, oh, I guess six. So we have a color for uh, in insertions and deletions. Um, but this is at a pretty large range in the genome, so some of the colors kind of merge together. Uh, and also, I was wondering what the value of the vis visualization was, because, you know, there's a lot of data to take in. Do you, are you trying to take advantage of the human ability to pattern match? Yeah. So um, there are cases uh, in, in which people use visualizations when they already know what they want to look for. So in that case, I wouldn't recommend Mango. I would recommend a local machine where you have a specific point query. So yeah, uh, it's the ability to pattern match and the ability to explore. So what we wanted to support is those point queries on large data sets as well as zoomed out regions. So it is, it, is, um, it is depending on the individual's ability to pattern match. But if, if we keep trying to abstract that uh, process, it often turns into a terminal. You know? So it's, it's a very uh, fine line between allowing the user to explore and then uh, just you know, cre creating a command line uh, interface that people can use. Um, but yeah, I, I do think we could do more in pointing users in the correct direction. We've looked at uh, mo user modeling and data modeling um, algorithms that can actually refer users to specific areas based on what they've already viewed. We just haven't implemented them yet, so. Cool, just a quick question. Uh, thanks a lot for a great talk. Um, I might have uh, misunderstood the problem that's being solved, but. Um, have you found a need to re-implement, you mentioned a range tree on the client in the JS, or is it more, um, it, you know, the query small enough to just send to an individual client uh, every time? Uh, right now, all we have is sort of back end that, that sends it to the client every time. But we're working to, um, like you said, sort of cache the results on the client so you, you, uh, you sort of short circuit that round trip time back to the server. Thanks. Great, well, uh, thanks a lot.